Hi there, Simon from simonwoods.com. Faced with four Brazilian red wines. Uh, once upon a time, this wouldn't have been a uh, particularly exciting prospect, but uh, I'm actually looking forward to it. Uh, I was in Brazil a few years ago, and uh, I looked at uh, what was happening in, in quite a few of the, uh, the uh, up-and-coming wineries, and they were up-and-coming then, they've up-and-been, and, been, and uh, they're still getting better and better. So... Um, What's interesting about Brazil is, um, for some reason, white wines are down there, uh, sparkling wines are there, uh, but red wines, from my experience there, was, uh, they're, they're the ones that are moving onwards and upwards. Um, other interesting things, they've got this um, Italian influence, a lot of the, uh, uh, where, they, where they grow grapes in the, in, in the south of, of the country. It's an area that really, prior to the 1850s, uh, there was hardly anyone there. But then a group of, uh, of, uh, of people from northern Italy moved in, brought their heritage, brought their wine growing expertise, brought some of their grape varieties. So, um, uh, whereas quite a lot of the wines that are, are being made now are made from Bordeaux varieties, uh, you're also getting these uh, strange inputs from uh, things like Tiroligo and Nebbiolo. And, well, the first one I've got here, one called Ancelotta. Um, uh, uh, so this is Don Gorino Gran Reserva Ancelotta 2007. Now, back in Italy, uh, Ancelotta is... Uh, it was not a main. It's not a, a huge grape. In fact, one of its main roles is um, as being part of the uh, uh, blend for some Lambruscos. Is it Lambrusco in uh, in still form? Actually, it looks a deeper colour than that. Let's give it a sniff and see where we get to. This smells like rich, rounded, ruddy, um, spicy. Uh, yes, vanilla tinged, but not too vanilla tinged wine. It's it's on that um, uh, that certainly prop forward um, type of build but it still feels like there's a bit of freshness in there it doesn't feel like the fruit's gone overripe and uh, I don't know whether it's the grape variety the Italian heritage or what but it also feels like there's a savory element there it's not feel it doesn't feel like it's going to be one of those too sweet too over the top it feels like it's going to be big rich bring me some meat but um, not too big intriguing stuff um, I like some bits of the wine and I don't like some bits of the wine. Um, the things that I like about it is it's got this savoury, uh, you, you can taste it's come from a place, it's got this savoury soil-like character coming through. Um, bit of pumice stone in there. But um, if anything, maybe they've just got a little bit, it's a bit too ripe, a bit too lush. As I say, it's not gone onto that overripe character. But maybe I'm missing a little bit of freshness. And uh, so there's a juiciness and roundness and certainly very happy, happily polished that off with a, a rather large steak. But um, in terms of glossiness, just that little bit too, um, a little bit too polished. Good. Uh, I think there was a better wine to be made there. But these guys have probably been, I don't, I, I don't know this winery. Um, I'm not sure how many vintages that they, they've done, but um, it's probably less than five. And for... For someone who's doing that uh, at this level, it's pretty good. Okay, next one down. Um, we are on. Um, uh, we're in, in a different province here. This was this was with Serra Gaucha, uh, which is the main wine growing province. Uh, this one here, we're in Serra Catarinense, which is just to the north. Uh, so it's Santa uh, Santo Emilio Vinicola, and it's the their Leopoldo Cabernet Merlot, um, two thousand and seven. So all these first three, 13.5% alcohol. Well, they're like their oak here. This is big, bold, toasty oak. Um, and uh, for some people, it's going to be too much. For other people, they're going to go, mm, I like that. Um, it's that, what I call the blue ribboned or the taxi wafer biscuit oak. Um, I don't know if they make, still make either of those biscuits, but they're ones that I still have this uh, uh, memory of in my mouth. Uh, in my mouth. Memory in my mouth? Memory in my brain! Um, so there's uh, toastiness, there's this um, bit of almond, a uh, bit of vanilla in there. That's that type of flavour. Um, and uh, fruit flavours almost struggle to get past that at the moment. Uh, there, there, there's this rounded plummy berry, but um, yeah, it feels uh, that the oak is the, the main factor at the moment. It may open up, so I'll give it another swirl, and then I'll come back to you and tell you what I think it tastes of. Very ripe, very rich. It's gone onto that chocolatey, as I say, the chocolate wafer biscuit. Um, I miss freshness. Uh, the first one had a bit of that savoury character that was um, that was redeeming it. Here, uh, I know there'll be lots of people who love that style. I love that almost pruny, uh, port-like style. Um, uh, but um, for me, pruny and port-like, are. there are some people who lo love those styles of wines. Personally, I like a little bit of freshness in my wine. And um, I, when, I, when I went to... Um, 
uh, to to uh, to the southern Bra Brazilian wine producing countries, uh, wine producing regions. Uh, the wines I like tended to like were the ones where they weren't quite pushing it as far as they have here. Uh, it's it feels like they're almost going into things that will appeal to certain American critics rather than uh, uh, people who like actually like to uh, like a bit of freshness in their wine. Um, so I can't fault its intensity. Uh, I think it's very well made, but. I want more freshness. I want I want to taste more of the fruit rather than the wine making. Let's see how we get on with number three. Uh, Salton uh, Talento. So Salton Winery Talento is the name of the the um, particular wine, and it's a blend of um, Cabernet, Merlot, and uh, Tanat. Um, we are very close to Uruguay here, and Uruguay has made a name for itself with Tanat. Uh, but I think that uh, Brazil has um, the potential to out Tanat Uruguay. So uh, let's see what the, what this is like. Now they don't seem to be as trying as hard as the in the previous two wine. This is a wine that I can actually see way through. The other pre the previous two were opaque. Uh, this one has, has got it, um, it's it's still quite deep in colour, but you can actually see through it and uh, uh, it feels like it's going to be a lighter, uh, again more on that savoury style as we were getting in, in, in the first one. Is it the tannet? Is it the way in which they've made the wine? Um, it feels like they've not tried quite as hard, they've not gone so much for the extraction and uh, maybe made a uh, fresher wine in, in the process. Uh, there are a few things about it that I'm not quite so sure about though. For example there's this um, slightly milky lactic edge that um, that I, I'll be interested to see how it tastes. Let's try it. Interesting, this one, uh, because uh, I, as I said, I think it's the it's the, the the palest of the three we've had so far. But uh, still, uh, it feels like there is a, a really quite ripe, uh, ever so slightly raisiny when when the grapes start to shrivel. Maybe they've not gone to raisins, but they've lost a little bit of their freshness and their skins have started to shrivel. Um, you're getting the intensity. And uh, it feels like it's the Tanat as much as the of the three grape varieties, even though it gets the um, lowest billing of the three on the back label. It's the Tanat that's uh, that, that's coming through most strongly with these uh, what I call ashy, chocolatey tannins. And um, I miss a little bit of the Cabernet Sauvignon freshness, um, but um, uh, it, I, I'd be hard pushed to say whether I whether I prefer that to to the two that I've gone before. Maybe it's a toss up between that and the uh, Ancelotta, which I prefer. But um, yeah, if if anyone's from Brazil is watching this, I, I'd like a little bit more freshness. And it may be that the uh, the, the these wines that I'm I'm tasting are the most ambitious ones. In which case, still freshness is. Uh, is something that's going to keep your wines going. Just because something is intense, tannin, and has alcohol doesn't mean it's going to uh, uh, it's going to last well. Ask the people in the Barossa who were influenced by uh, some of the American critics. Ask the people in Priorat the same question. I'm not sure uh, of the long-term future of that. Let's put it that way. Let's see how we get on with the heaviest bottle. Uh, this is the Merlo Terroir from Miolo. Um, and this is uh, Serra Gaucha, and in particular Valdos Vinedos, which is uh, it's it's Appalachian Controle. It's the only I think it's the only one that uh, uh, that Brazil has a denominated origin. And I think for your reds, you're supposed to have a minimum of 60% Merlot in your in your wines. I'm never quite sure when people push their wines down an Appalachian um, system quite so early in their evolution. Uh, is it a good thing or a bad thing, or is it a limiting thing? And um, anyway, let's try the wine. These guys are usually pretty good. Now again, we are on the intense fleshy side. Uh, Michel Roland has been a consultant here, so um, and, and uh, if you're not a Michel Roland fan, um, then you'll sort of go, oh, it's going to be big and pruney. Uh, and if you are a Michel Roland fan, you're going to go, oh, it's going to be big and plummy. And if you've never heard of Michel Roland, basically he's a guy who's based in Bordeaux and uh, goes and consults at wineries around the world. And um, uh, critics of him say he imposes a standard formula. Advocates of him say he improves the winemaking and enhances the terroir. Um, but uh, here, um, what I get is maybe because it's a younger vintage, maybe because it's a, a it's Merlot, maybe uh, it, it's higher alcohol, but it feels like it's got a, um, a. It doesn't feel like it's maybe trying as hard as some of the ones before. Uh, I don't know whether that's just it's good terroir in this uh, place, Valdos Vinedos. 
um, or whether uh, these people have got more experience than the other guys. Uh, but it feels like it's, uh, while it's going to be a rich, rounded, full, fleshy, plummy wine, uh, it's not going to be, it's going to be a, an assault, but it's going to be an assault with a kiss at the end of it. Well, I love that for its rich, plummy intensity, uh, and uh, there's a bit of toasty oak there, and I get a bit of earthy terroir, it's, it's called Merlot terroir, I do get a little bit of that earthy soil character coming through. If I have a problem with it, it's, I suppose it's a problem across all four of them. These are wines that are trying to shout at you rather than have a polite conversation. And uh, they're trying to over-impress uh, with, uh, with their six packs, with their cleavage, whatever it wants to be. I just wish that they would have the confidence to say, we've got really nice fruit here. We've got, we've got talented winemakers. We don't have to try too hard. These are the sort of things that, someone that sometimes I put in my notes, TTH, trying too hard. Um, so, and in the way that when you meet someone who's confident, they're not loud, they're not showy, they're not pushy, they're just confident in themselves. Uh, I think that that will come with Brazil. I mean, it, for, all of these wines uh, have probably have a track uh, record of less than 10 years. Um, and so I'd love to look back at them in 10 years' time and, uh, and, and see what the progress has been. For the moment, um, I find them very entertaining and um, proof that Brazil is not just football, it's not just um, carnival. It's got wine and it's got it coming out of its pores. See you soon.